Sean, are you feeling good after getting to finally see a hockey game live in person that you were working at? And I joke a little bit, but you got out. You aired yourself out and you got to cover a Devils game, didn't you? I did. Game story for the first time. I can't remember how long. And I still did better than you. Whoa. <laughs> wow. That hurts. You know what? The game story that's on NHL.com right now doesn't even look like the game story that I wrote. <laughs> I know that feeling. All right. Well, listen, Jack Hughes wrote that one for you. We're going to get into a lot of stuff going on with the Metro. Uh, it's pretty exciting in that division right now. But Cam Jansen, uh, who a, does a lot of stuff with the Blues, former NHL player, does a lot of stuff with Blues in Saint, with the Blues in St. Louis. He's going to be joining us here shortly. And so let's start there, right? Let's start in the St. Louis Blues. Craig Berube, who I like to think, Sean, that we got him his job because, you know, he did the coach's room for us and then he got hired to be the Blues coach and then he goes and wins the Stanley Cup, right? I mean, that's, our, that's on us. We did that. We joke, but he got fired. He's done there. And parts of six seasons, I'm not surprised. It didn't come at all as a surprise to me that Craig Berube's out. And that's not on Craig Berube and it doesn't make him a bad coach all of a sudden or anything like that. Things run their course. This time it did. I was surprised at the timing of it. I thought it would come out maybe the following morning, not the night of. But that's beside the point. But I was not surprised because, to be honest with you, I think the Blues are what the Blues are right now. They are what I expected them to be, if you will. Where are you on this? Well, if they're what you expected them to be, why is the coach fired? They're not what Doug Armstrong and ownership expect them to be. Yeah, but that's not Craig Berube's fault. That's ownership's fault and the GM's fault and the player's fault. This is the one bullet you have, right? We, we talked about this with the Edmonton Oilers and, and the Minnesota Wild. Um, you know, both teams who've gotten the new coach bump. And I'm sure as you sit in St. Louis and you're on the periphery of the playoff uh, race and you, you see these teams behind you that have already pulled the trigger and are starting to come up into your rearview mirror, it becomes a little more pressing to find the solution. And, and these are the exact same circumstances that Craig Berube came in on five years ago. The, uh, the Blues were actually worse. They brought in Berube for that spark, right, to hold the players accountable, go on an unbelievable run. Jordan Binnington comes up, career minor leaguer, has the run of a lifetime, puts them into the Stanley Cup playoffs, and then they go on and they win maybe the most unlikely Stanley Cup championship in recent memory. Um, and Craig was a huge part of that, and he's a huge part of the success that the Blues have had since, and I guess the failures, um, you know, and when you talk about things running their course, I, I think for a coach that's reliant on emotion, and I think Craig Berube would be the first one to say that's who he is. He's a compete guy. He's not an XO guy. He has guys on a staff that'll do that. Um, I think that does run its course, and I think as you change the team over and there's players who don't understand what compete means and what it can pay dividends how it can pay dividends it becomes much harder to get your message across the veterans there know what craig Bruby was about what his message was and what it can translate into i'm not sure some of the younger guys and the newer guys in that organization understood the tough love that was going on listen i get it we're going to touch on a lot of this with cam jansen when he joins us here shortly but i find it hard still to compare the two teams what the Blues were when Barubi took over to what they were now, what they are now. When they when he took over, to me, they were a they were just a greatly underachieving team that needed a spark. They had Ryan O'Reilly, they had Vladimir Tarasenko, they had Alex Ovechkin, Jay Bomeister, right? Jordan Bennington gave him the spark. Craig Barubi gave him the spark. They went on and they did amazing things. They were underachieving then. I don't think they're underachieving now. I think the Blues are a team that's a, you know, bubble out playoff team. I don't think that they're a playoff team. They weren't last year. I don't think they made any upgrades to make them a playoff team this year. They don't have a star player. They don't have that physical grinding, you know, snarly back end that they once had when they won the Stanley Cup. Bennington is not what he was. He's not bad. He's still pretty good, but he's not what he was. They were a team that I think some people might have predicted them to make the playoffs. Most probably said, eh, probably not decent, but not good enough in the Western Conference. And that's what they are. That's really what they are. 
So I don't think it's a comparison, to be honest with you. I don't. I think it's a team that right now is maybe internally expecting more than this team can deliver. Yeah, and look, nobody's going to know that better than Cam Jansen, who's around the team all the time, has been through some coaching changes during his playing career, um, you know, and we're excited to have him on. But there's other news that we need to talk about. It, it seemed it all happened on Tuesday. It was it was kind of a crazy day. It wasn't the one-for-one one deal day um, and free agency uh, a few years back with the Taylor Hall trade, but it, it, Tuesday was kind of a crazy day, and the Caps were in the middle of all of it. The Washington Capitals continue to find a way, right? They continue to find a way to get it done. And Alex Ovechkin has scored five goals. He has five goals. And honestly, the St. Louis Blues are 31st in the league on the power play. The Capitals are 32nd in the league on the power play. 8.2%. Ovechkin has five goals on 90 shots. He's shooting 5.6%. I talked about this in my mailbag this week, Sean, I wrote about this question came up. Do we still think he's going to catch Wayne Gretzky? I don't think so. I don't think it's going to happen. I mean, I look at it right now. He's scoring one goal every five games. If you do the math coming into this season, he needed 72 goals, three seasons left on his contract. That's 24 goals per season. But you're asking him to score 24 goals as a 38 year old. Another 24 as a 39 year old and 24 more as a 40-year-old, okay? So this was the season, coming off a 40-goal season, this was the season that Ovechkin had to do the one more run of 40 or 35. Now he needs 19 goals in 57 games, as we talked, just to get to 24. He's scoring one every five now. He's got to start scoring one every three for the rest of the season. Can he do that? Yes, he can. But that only gets him to 24. He still needs 48 more goals at 39 years old. And I think it's very clear right now what we're seeing from him that he's slowed down a little bit, that he's lost a step a little bit, that his shot might not be as dangerous as it once was. And beyond that, Sean, there isn't a guy on that team that can get him the puck the way Nicholas Backstrom was able to get him the puck. If Genny Kuznetsov's not doing it right now, Dylan Strom doesn't get him the puck the way he did. They need somebody there to really help set this guy up if he's going to do it. Ovi could lose five steps. doesn't matter. He doesn't move. <laughs> it's very true. Like, I'm not even being facetious, and I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. But the one thing that Alex Ovechkin has always understood is the quiet place on the ice. He finds it. You don't have to be quick to find it. You don't have to be, you don't want to be quick to find it. You just kind of want to shuffle into it and move very quietly. And then all of a sudden you're there and the defenseman's forgotten about you and you need that one split second to get your shot off. So he can lose as many steps as he wants. Look, he, he he's shooting very poorly right now. I, he's at five, five and change percent. Yeah. Um, you know, I think he's a 12% shooter for his career. Um, those things happen. It's a big enough sample size now where I think you're worried, but we've all seen Alex go on a heater, but I do think that he needs somebody to feed him the puck. And the other thing I'm going to say about it is, you know, there was just an assumption that this would continue at the same rate because of what he's done, which has been remarkable. But I'm going to give you some numbers right now. 25, 23, and 9. You know what those numbers are? Those are Wayne Gretzky's last. I mean, those are, uh, yeah, Wayne Gretzky's last three years of goals. Mm -hmm. 25, 23, 9. And here's another set of numbers. 8.7, 11.4, and 6.8. Those were Gretzky's shooting percentages for the last three years. A little similar. It's very similar. Ovechkin's at 5.6% right now. And, and to just go over, I mean... He was 14.7% in the previous five seasons combined, 12.9% for his career, now at 5.6%. Five goals on 90 shots in 25 games. And, Sean, those are that's a great comparison. I didn't look those numbers up. I'm glad you did. That's a great comparison, and it really tells you because it tells you the one thing that is indisputable. Father time is undefeated, and it catches up. And if your team is not near as dangerous as it once was, particularly on the power play, now he was a huge part of why that team was so dangerous on the power play, but he wasn't the huge part in setting it up. He was the huge part in finishing it. They're not setting it up, and that's the problem. He's not 
we can go over it again. Like he's not getting the puck in the places that he needs to get the puck and his shot. Listen, it's taken the league a long time, but now they know, right? I mean, they're cheating. If the the goaltender can cheat over a little bit because they're not as dangerous on the power play. They don't have the weapons that to, to utilize what they once had to, to make it dangerous on both sides, right? They don't have the vision on the power play anymore. And look, the capitals, if they want to make good here on the last two, maybe three years of Ovechkin's career in Washington. And that could be, that will be in Washington, by the way, that will be in DC. Maybe eventually they move to Virginia, but I don't think he's opening that building on that team. If they move, which is not a given, none of this has been formally, by the way, for people who don't know, that was part of the news on Tuesday. I was talking about Ted Leonsis had a, a press conference with the governor of Virginia. There's a proposed, proposed move to Alexandria, um, for the Capitals, a new building, a new complex with the the NBA team going, new offices for Monumental, uh, practice facility for the basketball team, the the whole works. You know, pie in the sky has been promised. Uh, I think it's 2028, um, but nothing has been formally signed. I, you know, it remains to be seen where they play. But I think if they open a new building, Alex Ovechkin gets a one year contract at least. I don't I don't think so. He'd have to get a two year contract if they're opening in twenty twenty eight. You're talking about a forty two year old Alex Ovechkin opening that building. A forty three year old, I'm sorry, Alex Ovechkin opening that building. Nah. No, I think he's gonna be back in Russia at that point. But regardless, he's gonna be back there, in my opinion, not being the NHL's all time leader in goals. Where are you, Sean? Do you think he does it still? I do because I don't agree with you. I think if he's not there at the end of this contract, he continues to play. I, I think he's a really proud guy, unless it's, you know, five goals this year, three goals next year, and, and you know, you kind of realize that the, 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 that it's over. But if there's any chance, I, I think he continues to chase it. And, and I think the one other number you want to point out here, and you mentioned it in, in passing, was Alex Ovechkin has 90 shots in 25 games. Mm-hmm. That's a little over three. This is a guy that averages five shots a game a lot of times. He's been over 300 shots countless times in his career, 400 at some points. He's not shooting the puck as much, which goes to your your assertion that uh, he's not being fed the puck. No, he doesn't. He's not getting the puck in the places that he can take that shot. And you know what's interesting is we're talking here all about Alex Ovechkin struggling, father time catching up. And before we get, and we're going to get to Cam Jansen here in a second. How about Sidney Crosby? 31 points, 28 games, just continues to roll on. Crosby's on pace for, you know, almost 50 goals this season or about 50 goals this season. You talk about father time is undefeated, and it will be with Crosby too. But that guy keeps getting it done, and it's just the different type of players that they are. Crosby's always been the guy that, you know, that drives it, that, that, creates and and you know is always around it Ovechkin's always been the guy that you know he'll fire it he'll goal scoring his celebrations his physical play will do everything for that team and ignite them but he still needs other guys right Crosby's the one that you know does it all for the Pittsburgh Penguins and still does it all for the Pittsburgh Penguins so but which also suggests that Crosby I mean that Ovechkin could do it because look again we've compared these two players our whole lives but Crosby plays a harder game. Yeah. Right? He he covers more ground, he's involved more in the play. Everything like it, it it's just a a louder game, right? Like that he plays. So if anybody's going to slow down, it should be Sid, right? I, I, Ovi's almost like a designated hitter at this point. Like he doesn't have to go out and play the field. He's yeah. Come up and hit every once in a while. Take that big slapper and hope something good happens. And again, that's not denigrating Alex's game. That's who he is. That's who he's been his whole career. It's a Hall of Fame career. There's nothing wrong with it. But when you look at Crosby and you see the level he's playing at and the amount of the game that he's involved in, faceoffs, uh, down low cycle battles, the whole thing, like that's an argument that Alex could come back, that this could just be a slump because the other guy is playing at his absolute prime. Yeah, he continues to be. And then it goes back again, once again, as we continue to belabor the point that the shot won't go away. 
Got to get him the puck in a position where he can be dangerous with the shot. So we'll see where that goes with Alex Ovechkin. It's going to be an ongoing conversation all season. But let's get to Cam Jansen. Uh, We spoke to him about the St. Louis Blues, the coaching change in St. Louis. Craig Berube out Uh, And the search for a full-time head coach continues. Drew Bannister comes up from Springfield of the American Hockey League to be the coach on an interim basis. Here's our interview with former NHL enforcer, former New Jersey Devil as well, Cam Jansen. Cam, thanks for joining us. So a bit of a change in St. Louis right now. Bit of a change. Craig Berube's out. Did it come as a surprise to you? Were you you surprised by this? Uh, Actually, yeah, I was. I think it surprised a lot of guys. Uh, a lot of people in town, including the fans who absolutely adore Craig Berube, I thought his seat was warm. And he'd get through the, uh, the rest of the season, regroup over the summer, see where things went, and maybe like the first 10 games, you evaluate how the compete level is and whatnot. But no, Army, Army saw enough. You know, he had enough. I know he was gone for four weeks, and he came back, and they just weren't going in the right direction. And listen, there's only so many, so many things you can do. Uh, to kind of get a spark because they are still right there and they do need to get into the playoffs. There's a lot of money involved and things like that. So Army put his foot down and he fired a guy that I'm telling you loved in this town and people aren't happy. And Army was okay with the fans. They got other problems with the Cardinals and John Mozeliak and whatnot that they they go after. But Army was kind of in his own little pedestal. He's very honest with the fans. But right now he's certainly taking a beating in St. Louis. But uh, – you could always grow out, uh, crawl out of that. Is this team better than it's shown, or is it on, is it on Craig? I mean, um, yes and no. I mean, look at the power play. Even if your power play was normal, you would you would be in the mix. You, you know what I mean? Like I know that they still are, but you would be in a better situation. Like little things like that. I know that has a lot to do with Steve Ott as well, but that's a coaching staff as a whole. Um, I do think that you know you lose four games, you lose to Columbus, you lose to Chicago, who's depleted. You know, you you lose to a, a Detroit young Detroit Red Wings team that has half the guys that well the guys that beat you or ex Blues players. All that combined, I think that no, I think the Blues have another level to them. How much farther they can go? What is their peak? Probably squeaking in and maybe going to doing a little bit of damage in the playoffs. But as of right now, I think that they needed some sort of shakeup. They could always go a little bit, uh, be a little bit better as a whole. And they're not doing it, so they're like, you know what? Our only option is to fire Craig Berube and see if this young Drew Bannister can come up there and ignite some of these young kids. Here's how I feel about this, and I want your opinion on this, right? I look at the Blues. They were not a playoff team last year. They were a 500 team last year. I don't think they're much better than they were last year. I don't know if they're much worse than they were last year. They're kind of the same. So you look at them and say, all right, maybe 38 wins, 38 losses, six regular, you know, six in overtime or a shootout, 38, 38, and six. That doesn't get you in the playoffs. That's not good enough. And that's kind of where I think they are. It's kind of where they are. They're in a slump right now. They won a few games before that. So I think I've heard they're playing below expectations. Do you think I don't think they're playing below expectations? Maybe five percent below. But that five percent could squeak squeak in. You know what I mean? So, like, there's I, – I, listen, I understand the Berube thing. Like, okay, what do you do? You can't get rid of this guy. You can't do that. You get rid of Berube. You need to change things up. Maybe you could fix things before things really get out of hand. I, I kind of understand it. Um, but, no, I, I, when, when you watch the team, though, like, you really do think there, there could be a little bit more. Just, it, just like, watching it. You, you know, like, if you're around the game, you understand that. Like, you're like, no, that guy – Little things that they're doing that they could change. It's not like they're getting outplayed because they're not fast enough and whatnot. And some of that may be true, but the way they're losing games, it's just little mental mistakes. They're not on the same page. Jordan Cairo, can you connect with him? He scored 37 goals last year. Yeah, he was dash 30, whatever, which is really bizarre to do. You got 37 mm-hmm. goals and you're still minus 36 or whatever it was. It's, it's kind of crazy. But no, so, so he's not – he's not where he needs to be so little things like that add up and i think he just again army was like okay we have to we have to make a change what can i do well i'm not gonna fire myself so chief you know it's a six year you've been around for a while you know how it is a revolving door in the nhl as it is when it comes to coaches he's gonna find a new job but the more i look at it the more i'm like "Ah, i kind of i kind of get where army's coming from 
And that may surprise a lot of people because a lot of people think completely different than me. I have to deal with this on the radio every single morning as well. But mm -hmm. now you look at it like you got to do something and hopefully this sparks sparks them a little bit just to kind of squeak in and make some more of that revenue back. As a former player, I have two points I kind of want to visit with you. They're somewhat related. Do sandpaper coaches have a sell-by date? You you see coaches like Tortorella, like like Baruby and, and other guys who are compete guys, right? They're not as much about X and O's. They're about, hey, go out there, lay it on the line. I don't care that we're playing Winnipeg on the second half of a back-to-back. -back. I want this. Do those guys have a sell-by date? And when you wake up the next day after coach is fired and you sit in that locker room and you realize what's happened and you see a new coach, does that just set something off in your head that you have to be better? Because we always see this new coach bump and I don't know where it comes from. It's the same team that stunk three days ago. Yeah. I, I understand where you're coming from. Okay. So the first point, uh, a sell by date, they, every coach is like that. Your X and O's coach is the same way. They're all waiting to be fired. Uh, yeah, like Andy Murray, who would, Write out notes left and right for everybody. Just put it under your bed at 4.30 in the morning. I liked it. It kept me. I'm like, I'll read this. What's going on? Who's who's the fourth-line tough guy? What's he do? What is it? This I, I enjoyed that. Keith Kachuk put his towel under there, so Andy had to like, jam it under there. Pretty funny stuff. But they, if you're an X and nose coach, you still have that as well. I mean, you truly do. But Ruby wants a lot of audio, but he's, but he's a simple coach to, to, to play for. Like He really is. Here's what you need to do. Go do it. He doesn't change things up every other day. That's also tough. Some of these X and those coaches, every other day in practice is something new. Now instead of going and flowing in practice, you're at the board. This is what I want. Blah blah blah. blah. So it goes both ways with that. As far as as far as having extra energy when a new voice and face comes in the locker room that maybe hasn't had any, you know, NHL coaching experience, I think everybody looks at each other like this is embarrassing. This is on us. Mm -hmm. Like Braden Shin and Benner and all those guys are like, wait a minute. Like, no, no, we better do something here. Everybody's talking about us in, in, all over the city. It's a tight city, man. I don't care if they look at social media or not. Everywhere they go, people are talking about blues hockey right now and the firing of Craig Bruby and the players and the leadership and Cairo and blah, 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 blah. It's happening everywhere. So, yeah, there better be a spark. You better figure something out. Now you guys are trying back out. Drew Bannister doesn't know many of you guys. He's going to come in and he's going to evaluate every single one of you. Now a lot of other coaches that may be hired in the future are looking and watching exactly what you're doing. Yeah, you're on the spotlight. You better get going. That's where the energy comes from, in my opinion. So we don't know how long Bannister is going to be there. He's an interim coach. There could be a new coach coming in in a week. He could have the whole season. At this point, we don't know. But if you're him, you come in and you look at a team that right now, bottom third in the league in goals four per game, bottom third in goals against, almost dead last, if not for the Washington Capitals on the power play, bottom third in the league on the PK, bottom third in the league in, you know, zone possessions. Where do you start? Probably special teams. Look, special teams affect momentum too, right? When you get owned, when you're on the power play, look, I'm not a power play specialist, but I'm right there. I see, I feel the negativity. I could feel the emotion on the bench. Mm -hmm. I had to be the cheerleader kind of guy to like try to bring that back up. If you power plays got awful, like everybody's like the dog, like it's a buzz kill. It truly is, especially when they score on you. You know what I mean? So like that affects the game. And maybe that will affect your zone entry because you're down and out because your power play is abysmal. Like there's little things like that. Fix a couple things and everything else will rise up. So I think Drew Bannister, to be honest with you, he's probably like, who cares? Let's go. I'm going to go in there. I'm going to try this. I'm going to try that. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do whatever I can. I might keep the job. I might not, but I'm on the spotlight right now. And I feel like if I'm him, I'm like, I can fix a couple things. I can get a little bit more. And again, we talked about it earlier, just a little bit more. This team's not that good. They're not that skilled. You compare them everywhere. We all get that. But if you do a little bit more, you might be able to get squeak in. And all of a sudden you're in a playoffs. So like roll the dice. Let's go. go. Benner might get hot. You might, you might win around. You never know. The one thing about Army, and you talked about it, that he wasn't afraid of the fans. He wasn't afraid of making an unpopular move. He's never been afraid to change this team around and, and to gamble. But with making this move, are, are you almost looking at the run-up to this year's trade deadline as maybe even more exciting than, than normal for, for Army? Because he's kind of painted himself into a corner, right? He, he used his last bullet. The only thing he has left is to change the team now. You're absolutely right. Yeah. 
big time. And he, you know, he doesn't like buying out contracts. I don't think he's ever bought anybody out. Um, but I think he, I believe he did relay that I'm down for anything. I'll sit you down. And we'll put mm-hmm. we'll put you in the minors. You know what I mean? And we'll take the cap hit or whatever the case is, but we'll sit you down. So he was he's always honest. I'm telling you. Like he that's why people like him. Even if things are bad, he's gonna be honest with you. Um and no, he's he's backed into a corner too. Look, he he sounded for a big, tough looking dude that's successful in this town where he's walking on water for a long time, just so you guys know, big time, as he should. But now when he speaks, he sounds a little bit vulnerable. Like and he does, and I and I, and that, I think that's healthy. I think he's like, look, I'm next. You know, like of course I'm you know, I, I'm not excluded from all this, even starting with not signing Alex Petrangelo. And at the time I'm like, Yeah, Army, do your thing, I'm gonna trust you. But you look back at that and you're like, Ooh, yeah, yeah. That's just like, oh, that's your anchor. Watch him. He's so good. Like they're so good. So it's like he controls the play. He was your leader. You know you how many minutes, good minutes you're gonna get out of him. He's gonna clear the front of the net, which has been a problem the last two years with the blues. So he has his mistakes. He understands that. And so now he's kind of like, listen, I got to do what I got to do to save this. And if it doesn't work out, then I know this whole, this whole thing's going to blow up. I'm still shocked they didn't sign Petrangelo, who obviously goes and wins yet another Stanley Cup with the Vegas Golden Knights. Anyway, well, that's lost. They can't do anything about that right now, but they can no do something about who's next behind the bench if it's not Bannister and he's just an interim as we we talked about it. He's going to get his opportunity. I agree with you. He, he's going to get his opportunity. This is his chance, right? I mean, he's going to do whatever he can here. But, the, you know, if we look big picture here, if it's not him, they're coming off of a coach who's got that snarl to him, right? That 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 type of guy. Do they need a different type of coach? Is there, Are you looking at a – and, again, I don't know how good of a coach he is, but Jay Woodcroft was with Edmonton, and they had success. Uh, listen, Army knows Kenny Holland very well. Woodcroft worked for Holland. He knows Jim Nil very well. He worked for Nil. So there is connections there that he can go to, but that type of coach, you know, it, it, do they need a different type of coach to get this team to the next level? Is, is I think that's really what he's got to be wrestling with right now. Maybe, but sometimes it's not even a different type of coach. It's just the coach, no matter what type of coach he is, you just, it's, it's enough. Like some players just will be like, I'm, blocking you out and I know that sounds kind of goofy and be like how can you possibly do that well <laughs> sometimes you just can't help it like it just happens you know what I mean whether it's an again an X and O's kind of coach or kind of a Craig Berube type but every coach is different anyway from Dave Evanson who we just had on our podcast who just seems like the coolest guy ever like he's pretty hardcore does his thing seems always like he's in a bad mood but when you talk to him he seems, yeah. he seems pretty cool <laughs> he seems like a great player coach listen Craig Berube's hardcore you know like, he's cool if you're going to go out and have a beer with him. But, like, if you're a young kid, I'm sure if he's not talking to you and he kind of gives you that scary look, like, you're probably like, damn, like, what's going on here? Like, that could be good and bad, you know? So I don't think it's a different type of coach. I just think it's a new voice as a whole. Everybody's different. Even if they're kind of similar in ways, they're all different. You know what I mean? So, so no. And, and not to mention, like, the players, you need to be better, too. It's not mm-hmm. just on the coach and Doug and all that. You guys, the captains from Braden Shin, Benner's been playing pretty decent. But as a whole, you guys need to be better. Power play, like Stevie I can only tell you so much. Figure it out as a group. Tim, I'm glad you mentioned your podcast, the Cam and Strick podcast, because it's fantastic. You guys have on the best guests. Really enjoy listening to it. So I wanted to pick your brain a little bit, knowing that you know a little bit about hockey in general for that and your radio show um, and not just the blues. There's so much young talent in this league right now, just dominating, right? You look at Jack Hughes with your old team, the Devils, other guys across the league that are doing it, uh, Matthews, Marner, all those guys. That wasn't the case when you played. Like, you didn't step into this league and dominate unless you were, like, super, super talented. But it was still very hard because it was such a different league. Like, why do you think these guys are able to come in at 18 and 19 years old? Bernard is the is the latest example, you know, playing at a point to game and just be so successful so fast. Well, because they're machines now, like the robots, I should say. Not in a bad way. Like in 05 when I came in the league. Okay, you had Sid, you had Ovi. Who else was an 05 big dog? Maybe Ricky Nash. 
th- so those guys were dominating. Like their first couple of years, they were dominating. They were superstars right off the bat. But the, you're you have so many different people in your corner when you're a superstar now, to where they're like, this is how you need to be. This is what you say here. This is what this in this situation. Oh no, we're gonna have somebody looking after you for this, this, that, and the other. So they they have they have so much guidance and teaching going into what they're to be a professional athlete. Look what Connor Bedard went through. It's horrific. Like that's horrible what happened to him. Okay. And I know Corey Perry had like he did his own weird thing, but it had nothing to do with that. That's a stupid rumor by some guy. That came out, and now this is it blew up so fast that you couldn't even contain it. Chicago should have done something about that, but Bedard handled it like I would have lost my mind. My dad would have lost his mind back in the day if that would happen to me. Are you kidding? Even if it wasn't true, he would have lost it. But those these people, they, they, they're, just, they're guided so well now. These young kids, whether they're going through the uh, the USA program, they're in college, juniors up in Canada now is completely different. Like you're not. Like you're, you're, you're watched, you're, you're guided, you have agents, you have therapists, you have all this. So I think that's why they're able to become a man and go in there and handle all kinds of crazy stuff a lot better. It's a great answer, Ken. It's a good, it's a great answer. I got one more for you. And it's also a big picture league wide question. So we saw it several years ago when Baruby took over the, the blues go on that, you know, go from worst to first, go on that run, win the Stanley cup. Is there a team now that you're looking at in the national hockey league? And maybe it's the blues. I don't know. Um, though I don't think it is. Is there a team now in the NHL where you're looking and say they're kind of middling right now, but they could take off? Is there one team that you could see right now? That's a good question. I like the I like where the Kings are at, and that's an obvious kind of thing. I'll, I'll give you I'll give you a team that really no one talks about. Maybe a couple of days ago because a big thing happened, and my boy that runs it over there, who took care of me with the Devils, is doing a pretty dang good job for not having too many superstars, and that's the New York Islanders. Mm-hmm. They're just quiet. They do their thing. I love Lou Lamarillo so much. And I kind of root I root for them. Their fan base is crazy. Yeah, a little crazy. Maybe too much crazy, but I like that as well. And they, you know, they got some pub with uh, John Tavares going in there and doing this thing. I'm so glad he did that as well. Kind of shove it in their face a little bit. But I don't know. Like, you get a team like the Islanders, it just, they would scare me. In a in a playoff run, I, I, they, for some reason, and they're like, "Well, why they have so no, just 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 the way they play." And I know who's upstairs watching, and there's some kind of weird thing that he has on players, man, where they can be disciplined and they'll block that shot. And that Robert Pertuzzo, who just got let go from the Blues, is going to go mm-hmm. there and he's going to make a big play at a big time. I don't know. Call me crazy. It is where this, but I'll throw the Islanders at you. So I got to ask you really quick before we leave. You mentioned how crazy their fans are. It's always been the Ranger fans, right? The blue seats, the whole thing. I think mm-hmm. Islander fans are more passionate than Ranger fans. You played in front of both audiences as the villain. Who wins that? Who wins that battle? They're all crazy, and I love it. They're all crazy, even from Philly to the Devils to the Islanders to the. They're all connected, by the way. They're all the same. I'm telling you. They all know each other. Like, if you play for the Devils, every Islander fan knows who you are, vice versa, this, that, and the other. And eventually, after a while, if they watch it and and you retire, they're always not. Anytime I go to the Devils, the Blues will fly me up there to do the Devils game. I'll go to uh, watch them play the Islanders, walk around the rink, and they're so nice. They're fighting in the stands in front of me, throwing beer on each other. But they come up like, hey, Cam, how you doing? And I didn't even play for them. So, like, it's all like a mirage, I'm telling you. They're all cool. I like the passion. Um, you know, you want that. So that whole area, man, they're all crazy in a good way. We'll get you up here for the stadium series in, yeah. in February then. Let me know. That's Let me know. <laughs> I was about know. to say that. You got to come up for that weekend, no doubt. Cam, this is great. We love your passion. Thanks so much for coming on with us, all right? See you guys. Great stuff there with Cam Jansen. We'll see where it goes for the Blues. Maybe they can get the bump that the Edmonton Oilers have gotten with Chris Knobloch as their coach. We'll talk about that in a second, Sean. But first, there was some news, obviously, around the All-Star weekend coming up in Toronto. New stuff with the skills competition, and I like it. I like it. You throw a million bucks on the board, throw some money on the board. It's a one-on-one-on-one with whatever. We'll go down to the list of 12 players involved in this and and they're all going to be competing and these guys know right i mean the competition comes out in them these guys know it's a fun weekend in toronto uh it's a light-hearted weekend in toronto but you throw money on the board you put these guys on the ice you throw the television cameras on the spotlight on and i know 
that this is going to be a pretty darn good skills competition with the 12 guys competing in all the different events and the others, really the, the remaining 32 kind of just watching. You're going to get to 12 of the best players in the world competing in different skills competitions. It's uh, it's like a little American gladiators almost, but not really. It's battle of the network stars. There's the generational, the generational difference for us. That, I did see true. American Gladiators, but I was more of a Battle of the Network Stars kid. Um, and that's what this is kind of, going to kind of be like, right? That series of challenges and then the uh, the quote-unquote obstacle course at the end, which was always the best. You know, watching watching your TV heroes kind of go through that. And uh, so now you're going to get it in the NHL. And I think it's great, you know. Nothing against the skills and what it's been in the past. It's made some really memorable moments. But there's been a lot of times where guys have just kind of been pushed into events, right? Because other guys didn't want to do them or guys had done too many. It didn't really suit their skill set, um, you know, whatever it was. Now you're going to have 12 of the most well-rounded players, right? Four of them are going to be picked by the fans. So you'll have fan favorites there. I'm sure it'll be heavy Toronto Um you know, uh, to please the home crowd, which is not a bad thing because there's a ton of skill on that Toronto. Oh, team. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I just think over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of attempts to spice up the skills competition. And some of them have worked great. The outdoor events have been unbelievable, you know, in in Florida. Um and, you know, there's been other things. And, and I think Steve Mayer, who kind of does this whole thing, will be the first one to tell you there's some things that have fallen flat. But for me, the biggest thing is this has the stamp of approval of the biggest players, right? Connor McDavid was a huge part of this. And, and you need players like that to buy in and, and to help sell this and and to make it compelling. And that's what it's going to be. Yeah, I, I agree. And I like the fact that they're – well, I like two of the things. One, that it changes up. It's not the same thing. So it doesn't get stale. And, yeah, you're, at times you're just throwing things against the wall to see if they stick, right? I mean – that they, they, they've done that in the past. Some of them have, some of them haven't. This one I think will, because I think you're really going to get a f- complete buy-in from the players to really want to be involved in this. And number one, as you say, is Connor McDavid with that. And let's talk about Connor McDavid, Sean. Let's talk about the Edmonton Oilers. Eight wins in a row as we speak here on Thursday. Connor McDavid has points in 10 straight games, six goals, 19 assists, 25 points in a 10-game point streak. So I pose the question to you, Sean. Are the Edmonton Oilers hot now? simply because Connor McDavid has gotten hot? Or are the Edmonton Oilers hot now because A, Connor McDavid got hot, and B, they're playing the right way? Well, clearly it's B. Um, but Connor McDavid's a huge part of that, right? And But the biggest number in this whole thing is they've given up 13 goals. Yeah. Before this, they could give up 13 in a game. Very true. They almost did a few times. <laughs> yeah. So that's the difference, right? Their goaltenders are, are playing. They're facing less high danger shots, so they look better. Um, there's more confidence in the defense, um, so it's playing better. A- and they have the puck more, so they're not asked to play as much defense. So, you know, it, it, it's a, the whole, right? It's the sum of the parts. Um, Connor McDavid's a huge part of it, but... They look like a completely different team, and and I I don't know if it was just the grenade in the room, right? Like, your coach is done, here's a new coach, and you better wake up because we don't have any other things. We don't have any more arrows in the quiver. Um, Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe that's it. Maybe, you know, the message finally got through. You know, maybe part of Connor McDavid being better is he feels better. Um, He was clearly laboring early in the season with some sort of injury. And, 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 you know, they follow what Connor McDavid does. I think when he was struggling, they were struggling because you look at your best player and you're like, he's not who he is. What are Mm -hmm. we? And then now you look at him and you're like, he's going to win us the game. All we got to do is do our part. Um, So, you know, it's great. I mean, they're going for franchise record, right? Tonight um, for wins, consecutive wins for Edmonton Oilers team. That's pretty steeped in history, not recent, but, you know, you're talking about one of the historic franchises in this league who know a lot about winning to to be at that level after the beginning of the season, I, I, I think is close to a miracle. It really is. I mean, you think about it, their eight game winning streak has just gotten them over 500. They needed to win eight straight games, you know, between November 24th and now December. We're talking 14th so far. 
and all it does is get them over 500. That's how far behind they were. But look, th- there's a number there to with this streak. We talk about how, yeah, I mean, listen, McDavid has been terrific, okay? There's a couple other numbers. Number one, you touched on it, Sean. They're, they're not giving up the goals, right? They're even up 1.63 goals per game in this win streak right now. Their penalty kill is 96.2%. In their first 18 games, they were giving up four goals per game, and the PK was at 74.7%. So, yeah, they're killing penalties. They're not giving up the goals, but they have the puck more. They've won almost 55% of their faceoffs in this win streak right now. Previous, they weren't even winning 50%. Now, it's a, people look at faceoffs and they say, well, I guess it really matters, you know, location, time of game, things along those lines. And it does. But on your whole, if you're winning a lot more faceoffs than you're losing, you have the puck more. It generates your offense. You got players like McDavid and Dreisaitl who, when they get going, you have no choice at times but to hook or hold them. Draws penalties. Their power play is elite, obviously. Their power play in this winning streak is 44%, right? So it all adds up. It all plays a part of it. I think it's a market correction with McDavid. He was not playing at McDavid-like levels, and so you knew the hot streak was coming. And with the hot streak coming from McDavid, I felt the hot streak was coming for the Oilers. But you wondered, is the hot streak going to come where they're winning 6-4? Or is the hot streak going to come where they're winning the way they are right now, like 4-1? to And that is 4-1, to 4-2 to on average. That's the key thing for me, and that's why I posed the question to you before, but I think it's the it's B as well. McDavid's hot, but they're playing the right way. Is that because of the coach? Is this a coaching change, or is this just a team that kind of just said to itself, we are way better than this. My goodness, we're way better than this. I think that's part of it, and not to take anything away from Chris Knobloch, but, you know, you change things up, a new look. Everybody comes in the day a coach, a new coach comes in, there's a fresh attitude, and I think that's what we're seeing in Edmonton, really. Yeah, and there's a clean slate, right? And guys who felt like they were marginalized all of a sudden have a little pep in their step because, hey, it's a new coach. I could, I could, I could make something of this, right? I could make, I could, I have another opportunity. There's competition for jobs, um, the the whole thing, right? Except for in Edmonton, because of the salary cap, they're kind of scrapped as far as competition for jobs. Uh, you know, who's there is going to address, but ice time is certainly up for grabs and I, and I think there's been some changes in that um and, and I do think it's a new voice and, and look I think Chris Knobloch should probably you know when we do our trophy trackers around the new year should be in the conversation at that point for coach of the year like he certainly you know he's barely lost since he's got there um he's facilitated this but I, I don't think you look at the Oilers and say wow they've completely changed um the way that they play hockey, they're just doing it at a much higher level. And I, and I just think there was a embarrassment that set in and, and guys looked up and said, oh, we don't want to be here. This is not where we belong. This is not how I want to conduct the rest of my season. This is not what I signed up for. So let's get going. And off they went. There's a name here that we're not bringing up that needs to get brought up a heck of a lot more. It's a Hall of Fame name, Paul Coffey. He's running their D right now. First off, Paul Coffey has been around the Oilers for a long time. He's traveled. He was traveling with the team at time before, you know, before he took over as an assistant with Chris Knobloch when, when uh, the Oilers fired Jay Woodcroft and Dave Manson, who was the assistant coach at the time. Now, Paul, so Paul Coffey had the view. He knew what was going on with the team. He didn't come in kind of blind to it, and he knew what was going on. And now he's coaching that defense. That defense looks way better. That defense is playing better and they're playing kind of without fear of failure it looks like to me like they're just kind of they're they're attacking they're allowing you know their skill on the back end to to play a role in it he's a calming influence I think on this as well Paul Coffey deserves a lot of credit here and if you're a defenseman for the Edmonton Oilers and you're playing the way you were for the first 18 games of the season and you know you're giving up four goals per game and your team can't win then you've got a guy like Paul Coffey walk in the room. Your back's instantly up, right? Your chest is up. Your chin is out. You're like, let's go. What is this guy going to teach me? This guy knows everything. And I think we're seeing a little bit of that right now. So as much as we talk about Knobloch and McDavid and all the others, the goaltending, Paul Coffey deserves a lot of credit here too. 
Yeah, if the Hall of Famer tells you you can do something, I think you're a lot more apt to believe it. I, I thought it was really interesting. Derek Van Deest, one of our writers, uh, had a sit down with Jeff Jackson uh, earlier this week. And, and one of the questions was, you know, bringing in Paul and, you know, what they hope to accomplish. And, and Paul wanted nothing to do with it. Like when he was asked, he was like, oh, I don't know. I, I, I need to think about this. I need to I don't want to upend my life. And there, there was a concern that he would say no, that he would pass. And then he came back the next day and he said, I'm an Edmonton Oiler. I love the Edmonton Oilers. Whatever you need me to do, I'll do. And it's that attitude that carries the day, I think, more than the X's and O's, more than anything else. When somebody signs up like that and says, you know what, I love this organization. I love what they stand for. I'm going to inconvenience myself to try and return it to glory. How is you as a player? Do you look and say, no, I'm not really interested? Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. So the Oilers continue eight game winning streak as we talk right now, still climbing. Let's uh, let's move on. We touched on it earlier. The Metro Division. We talked a lot about the Capitals, but this division it's seven deep right now. I think at this point, while they're not uh, mathematically eliminated, but like, listen, I mean, the Columbus Blue Jackets are in deep here to try to c- climb back in this division. But you've got, I mean, that you just saw the New Jersey Devils. They're winning games now, seven and two in their last nine games. Just beat the Boston Bruins. The New York Islanders are getting the job done. The Philadelphia Flyers are four zero and two in their last six games. Uh, you, you know, Washington. Obviously, the Rangers have slipped a little bit in their last four, losing three of them right now. The Penguins are still hanging around in that mix. This division, Sean, it's the deepest in the league. I think we talked a lot. I remember coming into the season about the Atlantic Division being maybe the deepest because we expected the bump from Ottawa. We expected the bump from Buffalo. We haven't gotten that, but my goodness, this Metropolitan Division looks really good, really deep, and and you're talking all about this on a team I didn't even mention is the Carolina Hurricanes who are struggling right now. They just don't want a game, but like they've been struggling right now. I, I look at it and I say, is this the deepest? Yeah, Sean, this is the deepest division, and you got teams like Philadelphia, the Islanders, and the Washington Capitals who are playing above expectations in my mind. Yeah, they are. But you know what? In my mind, none of them are going to be around when the dust settles. I'm not buying the Islanders. You should know more than anybody. They weren't in my Super 16, and I know you were all about, all oh, the Islanders are going to be in this week, and you had already pre-assigned who was going to write it. Not for me, man. They don't win games in regulation. They blow leads like it's nobody's business. They're just... They're a team that can't separate themselves from anybody. Like, it would be one thing if they were winning two to one games, like the Devils won last night, but they weren't blowing leads. But they do it routinely. To me, a playoff team is not a team that plays a lot of tie, overtime, shootout games. You know, you can't consistently blow leads. And I still don't think they have the offensive firepower to do it so no i don't believe in them they're not in my top 16 i know islander fans think i i hate that franchise but i i'm just not buying it right now they keep doing it you know maybe i change my tune and, and then you know for the flyers i just i just don't feel like they have the firepower and, and the depth to survive a season right now i, I believe in i believe you're right about the flyers i, I think they'll fade Definitely. And I, if the Washington Capitals can't start consistently scoring and if their power play doesn't get up, I think they fade too. All right. And I know they've scored a bunch of goals in their last three games, four goals in each of the games, but they're still low in that. But the Islanders are different for me. And the reason I say that is because they're able to score a little bit more now. They do have some more firepower. We're seeing them score three plus goals per game. And I believe that over time here, you're going to start seeing Ilya Sorokin and Semyon Barlamov start to play a little bit better. They have not played that well. But I believe in those two guys in net, and I think that they're going to start getting some of these saves that they're not getting right now that has allowed teams to come back. I think the Islanders do need help on the back end. We'll see if they can get it. I don't know if they're going to be able to get it, but... They need a little, maybe another defenseman, but I think they start to get saves. If they can start to get the saves that we expect them to get, those four, three, four, three, three, four, four games, they'll become wins. They'll become wins more often, right, in regulation as well. 
if they can continue to score and they do have a little bit more firepower now. So I, I think the Islanders are a little bit more legit than you say they are right now. Uh, before again, we go, Dan, to before, the before we drop this topic, just so there's not a mob outside my house with pitchforks coming from the Hempstead Turnpike, let me give a little love to the Islanders. That Dobson kid on the back line is unbelievable and nobody talks about him. Point per game player, their their blue line is completely decimated. He stepped up. Like you're you're talking about a, a guy that should probably start entering the Norris Trophy conversation as, as a dark horse. He's not going to win it, but he has been probably one of the biggest surprises of the season, and he's just playing out of his head. Yeah, no, he's been playing great. I'll tell you a team I'm I am at this point worried for is the Carolina Hurricanes. They're, they can't get many saves. And I don't know how it gets better. You know, like that that's the team that I'm still a little like, okay, they play a hard game. It's a grinding game. They're not getting the saves. And now Svechnikov's out again. Is this the year, Sean, where we see the fade of the Carolina Hurricanes? Because it's been five really good years with Rod Brendamore, right? I mean, is this the year we're seeing the fade? Or is it maybe just one of those things where... Things are just aren't going, a lot of things are not going right at the same time. I think a lot of things aren't going right at the same time. They have two elite of defense um, to to not be good enough. Uh, they don't need to score a ton of goals. But they did get one save, and it was one of the saves of the year when they played Ottawa in the shootout. Kochetkov made that save yeah. on Brady, and it sent him cartwheeling into the boards with the aggressive poke check. Brady wanted a piece of Kochetkov. And he was ready. He wanted it back. They had to escort Brady to the bench. 10-minute misconduct. Fantastic little piece of theater right there. Yeah, no, they did get that. They did. But they're not getting a lot. They have the one of the lowest save percentages in the league. So right now, as we saw, saw talk here in the mid-December, I'm concerned for the Carolina Hurricanes. I am. We'll see in mid-January if I feel the same way. Are you going to tell Rod Brindamore that? No, absolutely not. But Rod Brennamore will tell you that. That's the thing. That's the beauty of Rod Brennamore. He's honest. All right, listen. We thank Cam Jansen. He was terrific. Talking all about the Blues, their coaching change. We'll see where it goes for them. The Oilers keep winning. I believe in the Islanders. Sean doesn't. Enjoy the hockey.